Warning, the following content contains sounds. Some sapiens of Homo have episodic memories with undesired correlation sensations with particular sounds depending upon their mood and personalities. Although many attach their identities with notions and actions, the mockery that is included in here is directed towards the latter two and not the first. Having said that, hello, welcome to Correlation Sensations, a show where I talk about your mother's mammalian protuberances. Yes, yes. Mm. <laughs> This is episode number four. For those who have listened uh, to episode four before, I am sorry, it did not work out very good. I was not happy with the quality. And if you notice right now, I am the only voice in the room. Yep, I was left alone. While Void had to go do something with uh, Captain uh, Grouch Gobbler. No, Grouch Gabbler. No, Graver. Grouch Gabber. No. Anywho, I feel like right now there is a space missing. Right where Void used to be. There used to be some type of hole or some other word like that. A hole where a void used to be. Void used to fill the void. Yeah. Anywho, Edwin Smith Papyrus is the topic for today. If you listen very carefully. Okay. There's a lot of information here. And uh, our story begins. Like every single story. It begins with the formation of the universe. Yep, because every single situation has to have been born from previous correlation of other situations, you know. But, that's okay. We'll just start off with the story that a lot of people made up already. It makes it way easier than going through you know, the gaseous clouds in the ominous dark universe forming the first stars and explosions which then result into various different minerals and other molecules that form together and collide and stretching and causing a little gravitational fields blah 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 yeah you can go listen to like What's that dude with the, the stuff on his face? Yeah, Morgan Freeman. Or that other dude who has other stuff on his face. Oh, Neil deGrasse Tyson. Yeah, that dude. But now you're listening to Gork. And he's already been through all that. So you just got to bear with me all by myself. We're void. Where's void? Okay, I collected myself. The story given is often started off with this Edwin Smith Papyrus having been buried within a tomb in Egypt around 1500 to 1600 BCE if you go by source number 2 and 3 in the episode description. But if you go by my primary source for the neuroscience timeline it says 1700 BCE either way 
It was a long time ago. In both sources, two and three agree with it being a copy. Yes, I said that right. Although the document has been dated as far back as 1500 to 1600 BCE, the shapes used were shapes that are associated with a much older date, ranging from 3000 to 2500 BCE. That's right. The hieroglyphs in different eras were different. That is how they came to such a conclusion. The place in Egypt where it is said to have been buried is in what is currently modern-day Luxor. But before Luxor, there was another city. The Greeks referred to this city as Thebes. But the original publicly known inhabitants of that area called it Waset. And out of respect for the original inhabitants that we know of, we will call it Waset, even though Waset will be like the last time I refer to this city, because this city's history is not what I will be going over today. And I doubt with every iota of my being that there is not going to be one more mention of this city or a set besides that one. Yup. In 1862 it is said that this papyrus made its hands into one called Edwin Smith, which would explain the name, right? Edwin Smith was a gentleman born in 1822. He was much more known for antiquities, which would explain his purchasing idea. Not too many people go down to Egypt to go ahead and purchase papyruses that are old unless they want to be known for something or they study that specifics or they just get off on that kind of stuff. But that is besides the point. It is said Mr. Smith purchased this item from one named Mustafa Aga. If that is not how you pronounce his name, so be it. But that is how I pronounce his name. So I don't care what you use with your mouth to make your sounds. No. Right, Void? Void? Oh, yeah, he not here. Anywho, let's do this. Mr. Smith happened to carry this item, the Edwin Smith papyrus, until he died in 1906. He failed, although he did try to decipher such a document, but not too much was formulated in the form of Egyptology in order to understand such a document. In fact, it wasn't thoroughly deciphered publicly being public, publicized by one named Dr. James Henry Breasted. He's a sapien of Homo who is also known for Egyptology. He was also known for founding the Oriental Institute of Chicago, which gives a free PDF file download to whoever wants to see the original publication in PDF format from the one named Dr. James Henry Breasted. It wasn't until 1920, which was 14 years after Mr. Smith's death, where his daughter Leona Smith had denoted, denoted, donated the papyrus to the New York Historical Society, which is when they uh, decided to go, hey, uh, Mr. James Henry Breasted, we know you like this stuff. You, uh, you take a crack at this because, wow, we, if you just take a look at these shapes, oh, it will have your head spinning because it looks nothing like the shapes used today for our modern languages. Dr. James Henry Breasted gladly deciphered the document and had it published in 1930. This publication 
from Dr. James Henry Breasted is said to be a two-volume edition in English containing commentary and medical notes. The medical notes were prepared by a physician named Arnold Lockhart. Along with the English translation, a hieroglyphic transcription of the scroll was included in said publication. Like many documents with age, like this 90-year-old one, Questions had been brought up throughout the years questioning the work of Dr. James Henry Breasted. And despite all the controversy that you can read today in modern times, this document is still given at least a little respect in having a vague understanding on what was said in said document, huh? Yep. This document is not as thoroughly complete or long as the Ebers Papyrus, which was dated around 1550 BCE, or as old as the Cahoon Gynecological Papyrus from 1800 BCE. Gynecological. Oh, this is a papyrus based on ladies' hoo-hahs. That is interesting. I wonder what they look like, huh? Do you think they have special symbols on there? What do you think, Floyd? Oh, yeah, they have special symbols for the vagina. Oh, thank you very much, Floyd. Yeah, this is one of the groundbreaking document, though. Not the gynecological hoods or what's it, but this groundbreaking document. The Edwin Smith Papyrus is groundbreaking because it's methodical and it shows that there's a thorough modernized version of a medical field in Egypt at that time. Wow we and it also shows how they can clearly see the effects of a brain damage and spinal injury ranging from different things like paralysis, like quadriplegia and also seizures and drooling, my favorite. And also, it shows the parasympathetic and sympathetic innervation being disrupted too, with things like uncontrollable erections and uncontrollable ejaculations and uncontrollable urinations. Yes, yes, erections, ejaculations, and urinations are all said to be included in the Edwin Smith Papyrus. Don't take my word for it. No, no. You can go look at this at the Oriental Institute on the webs, and it can show you a PDF file which you can download for free if you do not believe me. Hmm. Mike dropped. Ain't that right, Void? Yes, that is very right, Void. I mean, Gork, I'm a little out of myself today. That is right. I noticed you a little bit different today. Of course. You can tell that I have lost my voice because I have the flu. Oui, oui. Oui, Now, before I get into the once juicy but now all the crusty and dusty details, I want to go over another narrative, and this is the narrative of Egyptology and how they are uh, now modern humans think they have the acceptable amount of knowledge to break down these symbols that are, you know, not used today by anyone except Egyptologists. Imagine if it was all wrong. Imagine if the owl really meant hooters. Imagine if the snake uh, really meant wings. Imagine if the worms meant small peters that were not erect. Imagine if the knives meant bondage. Imagine all the people living for today. You may say I am a dreamer, right, Void? But you're not the only one. Perhaps someday you'll join us. And the world will leave us. You know, I might get in trouble using those words from Sid John Lennon. Hmm. Never thought about that. 
Anywho, back to topic, huh? Back to topic. Let's do this. The year 31 BCE is a popularly known year. It is when uh, Caesar and the Roman conquest decided to come all over Egypt's face. And then they spread their infectious Hellenism that they got from the Greeks. Huh, dirty, dirty Roman helmets. Yep, and there's something said along the lines of Caesar and some sort of fire in the library of Alexandria. The details are a little fuzzy. Even in the first century current era, Egypt also had uh, been combed on the face by Christianity. Oh, no, this is all over Egypt. Oh, Egypt is now sticky and crusty because it dried. This is said to be where they destroyed the Pharaonic culture. And then, in 250 current era, the Greek alphabet had interbred with six letters of the Demotic language. The Demotic language is actually cursive hieroglyphic scripture. So you have the Greek alphabet and only six letters from Egyptian culture. Very nice, huh? Very considerate. You can take this and you can have that. And that, and that, and that, and that makes six. But you have to have all this other crap. And your pharaohs? Pah! We'll take that too. And how dare you? You worship these, these bestiality gods. Gods made by humans binging different animals. I tell you what, listener, that does not work. I know from first-hand experience. The goat don't like it, the goat don't propagate, and nothing comes out of it. Nothing except for shame and sorrow and woes and alcoholism and a bunch of money deposited into a psychiatric ward. Anywho, we're gonna go on to something more important. Back to topic. This story continues with the last publicly known hieroglyphs being carved in Philae. Imagine that. There's quite a coincidence, coincidence there. Philae being the last place to have the hieroglyphics carved. Well, publicly known last place. In 394 current era. Such a specific date. Wow, we. Oui. And then it is said this location to be where Isis worship was uh, had survived until 570 CE. Even though there's a group called Isis, I don't think they're worshiping the Egyptian god because they're Muslim. That would be kind of weird, like some type of interbreeding between Muslim culture and ancient Pharaonic culture. I wonder. Never bothered looking that up. But it wasn't as interesting as this topic to me. Nope. It is said that there was some sparse worshipping of Cyrus and Isis too, which had spread throughout the Roman Empire, like a contagion. And uh, Pharaonic Egyptian culture was uh, passed through some writings from some Greco-Roman authors. One was named Herodotus, and the other was named Strabo. There was also a priest from Egypt named Manetho who compiled a list of kings from Ptolemy. No, for Ptolemy I. I'm sorry. Written in Greek. So, there was some sparse amount of history of Egypt that was preserved to a different language that was not completely snuffed out by might. You know with the Romans and the Greeks and the Christians. And also, I forgot to mention, one Muslim conquering happened too. I don't know too much about this, and not much is not said about it either. But I will tell you the AKA name for this Muslim that went over there is called the Egyptian Conqueror. Pretty dramatic if you ask me, all right, Void? Of course, he has to be dramatic, 
because if he was that dramatic, nobody heard or re remembered him. That is how they keep everything straight. Okay. Always interesting to hear from you, Void. Well, thank you, Gork. Well, of course. Oh, and the uh, given name for this Egyptian conqueror is Amar Aben Alas. I hope I pronounced it right. Do not jihad me or something if I got it wrong. Of course, it is a stereotype, and I'm only trying to be funny. Ha ha ha. See how funny I am? Cork? That wasn't very funny at all. Well, it's all subjective. Go away. What the? Why would you be so mean to me? I am only trying to help you out. If you don't learn how to be funny, how can you possibly accept anybody not laughing at you when you're not funny? You didn't make any sense. So? Oh, I don't mean to make sense. I can just talk the way I want to talk. And everybody will listen to me because they mean his void. And Captain Crouch Crabler will listen to me while I complain to you about how bad you're doing here down on Earth. Don't you give away our information. You're pretty good at doing it yourself. You forget to edit out different issues on our other podcast episodes. Hey, that's enough, please. I want to go back to that, please. Okay. Where was I? I was rudely interrupted. Oh, yeah. We got done with that dramatic name, dude, who helped alter Egyptian culture forever. Then we're gonna go all the way to 1799, where this trilingual Stella named the Rosetta Stone was found. It's, uh, it had these three languages, hence trilingual. One was Dematic text, the other was Greek, and the other was hieroglyph. Yep, it was found by a sapien of Homo named, uh, didn't give me a name. I didn't bother looking up the name. I just wanted to give you a little detail. He was from France though, I can tell you that much. And he was known for engineering. Does that make up for my mistake? No, but it will make up when I, when I do this. It's okay. See, it made up everything. So there was another human from Germany. I have, I have his name though, I think. No, I don't. In 1643, a German managed to preserve some Coptic grammar knowledge so, when you take that Coptic grammar knowledge and you mix it up with Rosetta Stone, you're able to get deciphering with the hieroglyphs. At least that's what the narrative was given to me. If I got this wrong, that's okay. I'm focusing more on the Edwin Smith Papyrus, even though I haven't been focusing on it as much as the narrative, but that is the way it goes. In 1828, Two named Jean Francois Champion and Ipeyoto Rossaini led an expedition to Egypt, which led to a publication that they both have publicized, hence the name publication, which is titled Monuments de l'Egypte et Nubi. Don't question me. Although these individuals are human, therefore they are prone to mistakes, much like yours truly, Gork. Wait, Void! We will accept what came down afterwards, huh? Because even if you have not studied it, and even if you haven't, you know, been taught it, you can look at these hieroglyphs and kind of get an understanding when you read what they translated it to. You're like, oh, that makes perfect sense. Men kneeling down with a, with a round object above head in some line penetrating it, looks like the man was injured, huh? Now we go to the subsection, once juicy, now old, crusty and dusty details. Topographically ordered for the most superior 
down, down to the thoracic lumbar spine. We have 48 medical cases dealing with trauma, and they are listed in the street types. It is said that even though the diagnostic techniques, the options for therapy, along with demographics, have changed considerably through the time, the rationale that has been given and on the spinal injuries are considered state of art by some in the academic community. And many people are astonished at this straight eyes for how it was structured because it was very methodical, like I've said. And each case holds the similar format of introductory heading, then you have the significant symptoms, and then you have uh, where most ca cases give an explanation section to assure clarification for the individual reading the street ties. Oh, don't let me forget, Void. Why you let me forget? I don't know. Sometimes I uh, don't pay attention, but that's okay. Yeah, it's okay. Because I remembered that street ties is a, is a document that's more like a manual for those who don't understand. Or a recipe. It says, if you shall encounter blah 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 with bloody hoodie booty, then you must do said blah blah blah. But if bloody bloody blue do the bam blue do, then you must happy to be hippity bo. Right? I have absolutely no idea what happened to you. Did you have a stroke, Quark? No, I did not. How dare you question me, Void? I will take you back to the dungeon. No! Yeah. Okay. Back to topic. It's also said that this uh, medical treatise is uh, something that was used for battlegrounds because it had uh, mentioned things like spear wounds and war axe injuries and different things like that. And a lot of treatises were used back in the day in the metal or in the battlefield. You needed a little manual to help you when things are going cuckoo crazy for cocoa puff I mean not cocoa puffs, for dusty puffs. Yeah. Let's break down the street test, shall we? Yeah. We have 27 head injuries, 6 neck injuries, 4 arm injuries, and 10 upper to mid torso injuries, which includes the 1 thoracic lumbar spinal injury, which is incomplete, number 48. Ooh, too bad it's incomplete. I bet you if they went all the way down to the little bitty toesies, you would have had something like 90. You would have had at least three to five different injuries to the genitalia because they focus a lot on the breast here, so I assume they'd focus a lot on the nutsack. Huh? Void? Yes. They would definitely focus on the nutsack. Yeah. They definitely would. Oh, uh, what we do here? That's say 10... No, forearm, 10 upper mid torso. Oh, I forgot. Four head injuries. The first four head. Oh, bear with me. I may have actually had a stroke. The first four head injuries are penetrating wounds to the bone. The next six frac or involve fractures to the cranium. Cases 11, 12, and 13 are fractures to the nose, while 14 is just a flesh wound on one side of the nose, penetrating the nostril. They caught this piercing gun wrong, right, Void? Ha ha ha! Very funny! Quiet, you! Cases 15, 16, and 17 are bone damage cases to the maxilla bone and or the zygoma. The next five cases, which are 18 or 22, are injuries to the area around the temporal bone either described by perforation, splitting, or compound fracture, with the exception of 18, where the temporal bone is indicated to be uninjured. Oof, phew. That guy missed it. 
23 is an injury to the ear, and 24 is a fracture to the mandible, while 25 is dislocation of said mandible. 26 is just a wound to the upper lip, while 27 is said to be of a gaping wound to the chin. The next two cases, which were 28 and 29, are also gaping wounds. The specific location were not indicated by me for some odd reason. The first two wounds, gaping wounds, are to the throat, penetrating to the gullet, while the next is a gaping wound to the cervical vertebrae. Case 30 is a cervical vertebrae sprain, while case 31 is a cervical vertebrae dislocation. Before I go any further, just to clarify for those who may not know, cervical is like leet or leek, Greek or Latin, not leek, Greek or Latin, for neck. So that makes sense. Cervical mean neck. Yeah, so 30 and 31 are cervical vertebrae damage. One is sprain and uh, the other is dislocation, like I said. And 32 is displacement of the cervical vertebrae. Could you imagine that to have a case 32, where you have your vertebrae in a place where it should not be, is being a bad cervical vertebrae? What you say, Vaughn? Yeah. Yeah, to be a very naughty, naughty cervical vertebrae. Yeah, maybe we should punish it, maybe spank it back in place. Oh no, it doesn't matter because I don't think he will survive the damage. Yeah, you're right. Let's just throw him into a ditch. Yeah, you want to go around the back and put him in the place where we put the other bodies? Yeah, and don't talk too much about it because we might give away our information. You know, some people may like the dead bodies more than we do. You know. Necrophilia. Oh, that stuff is gross. Yeah, it's stinky. Stinky worse than my breath right now. Yeah, I told you not to eat that shit off the ground. But it looked like a chocolate Tootsie Roll. So, a lot of things look like other things. Just because it looks like it does not mean it is it. Especially if you ignore the smell by using a little clothespin to cover up said nose. You might want to stop. Okay. Thank you very much. Back to topic. So, we have the dislocation. It in 33 is a crust cervical vertebrae. Oh, that sounds way worse than just the displacement or just a dislocation. Whew. Then we have case 34 and 35, which are damaged clavicles where 34 is dislocation and 35 is a fracture of the clavicle. Case 36 describes humerus bone fracture. 37 indicates a fracture of the humerus as well, but unlike 36, 37 indicates rapture of the soft tissue overlaying the humerus. Not so funny now, are you, Bone? Are you? Void? No, I am not funny, except when you hit me just a little bit. That's right. Case 30 said, 30 said, 38. Case 38 is said to be the split of your humerus. Split like hot dog bomb. Then we have a case 39, which is said to be of ulcers of tumors within the breast tissue, postulating it to be a result of from underlying breast injury. Ooh. Breast injury resulting in tumors. I wonder if it's just deep infections, you know. Case 40 is ambiguous because it states an injury to the breast. Nothing else is indicated in the table of contents of the PDF file for the publication that Dr. Breasted had done. The lovely case of 41 is lovely. You want to know why? Because it's an infection with necrotic tissue in the breast. Well, I think we're past the breast injuries. I'm pretty glad that we're past it. 
My polyps have been inflamed ever since I started talking about their breast injuries. Oh, we oui, woo. 42 indicates a sprain to the sternocostal articulations. So, the sterno, the sternum, and the costal kind of joined together, and the articulations are like the movement joint placement, yeah. That is all I can explain on that one. I am not a doctor, what do you expect, you know? It's okay, you study. And just because you're not a doctor does not mean you have studied and you understand most of the words. It doesn't mean that you cannot learn further on when you continue to study for years and decades until you're old without a doctor's degree and you spend years of studying things because you really like it but never really get any monetary wealth from it or considerable considerations. That's enough, Void. Stop talking to me. Okay. Back to topic. In uh, case 34 or 43, ooh, that is funny. I mixed up the two numbers. Like, like some people who have that one issue. Case 43 is a dislocation of the sternocostal articulations. And case 44 is a fracture to the ribs. And, uh, ooh, uh oh, 45. Uh, look like I spoke too soon. Brace yourselves, audience, because 45 is also a breast injury. It describes a bulging tumor, or multiple bulging tumors on the breast. Ouch. Oh, tumors. Oh. It's even worse since I did the bench press yesterday. Case 46. Is indicated to be an abscess with what is described as a prominent head on the breast. Ooh. This breast has an abscess with a prominent head. I wonder if the doctor is supposed to pop it after putting a warm cloth on it, huh? You know? And it says, where? No. Beware of explosion. Do not want infection to splooge in eyeball. Not good. Oh, I wonder if it was a third nipple, though. wonder if case 36 is this abscess with a prominent head is much more like just a nipple with a nipple breast, a third nipple. And he just assumed it was an abscess, you know. You know, and I think it wouldn't be the Egyptians just assuming it. I would think just the uh, wrong you know, translation of the hieroglyphs that are so old that it took hundreds of years of multiple humans from different parts of the globe to coalesce bits of information they gathered after looking at the stella, the trilingual stella called the Rosetta Stone. You know, they could be wrong. Case 47 is a gaping wound in the shoulder, while case 48 is a sprain to the spinal vertebrae which is also the incomplete case. Rounding up the brief overview. Yes, that was brief, audience. But lucky for you, you have Gork, who wants to go into more detail. Because this is for neuroscience, not just injury. Let's look into case number three, shall we, Void? Uh-huh. The PDF page. If you didn't download it, go download it now. Oh, wait. You can just pause it, or I can just be silent. Silent like the night. I can also do a little, you know, hum along while you look at it, you know. Look it up, you know. Type in, you know, Chicago, University of Chicago Oriental Institute, Edwin Smith Papyrus, free PDF. Should pop up on Google. She's pretty good at giving you stuff. I, what kind of tune you want? You want it? Just do it. Just, just don't. I won't stop talking until you do it. And no, no. Even though it is a recording, I know because I've listened to podcasts where they tell me to go do something and I don't do it. And I just sit there and I wait for them to be done. But I can be very compelling because I can get very annoying. Ain't that right, Void? Yes. So, so I. 
that was that was something you should have corrected me on and said, no, you're not annoying. Oh, I'm sorry, Cork. You're not annoying at all. Yeah, that's right, baby. Oh, wait. You're not the baby. You're Gork. I mean, you're Void. Woof. You don't look anything like me. Sorry for that, audience. There's a little problem. Like I said, I think I had a stroke. Jeez. It was like one day I woke up and I felt like, like, a, like a feast grabbed my brain. And did you, did you get it yet? You get the PDF yet? No? No, you didn't? Yes, there's a couple who did. I heard them. Yeah, but you, you, bone swaggling, bone swagger, you, you gooch gobbling nut nibbler, your cock cramming caboose handler. What? You don't talk like that to me. You go do it, because I am in charge. You let it on cork, right? Right now. So what we talk about? Oh yeah, I had a stroke. This is for the people who, you know, that already cut up and have the PDF and are unfortunately waiting for the stragglers to go get the PDF file. It's for free, for God's sakes. You can look at it. You are interested enough to go listen to the podcast. You might want to see all this beautiful shit in there, huh? So anyways, it felt like some mystical being had reached into my ears with both hands and strangled my brain. It felt like And then I remembered I needed to eat. It's been like two days since I ate and I was kind of pissed off. But yeah. So I think that's the last one. If it's not, uh, you know who you are. And you're pretty bad. Anyways, case number three on the PDF is uh, on page 47. But for the original publication, if you're awesome enough to have that, is page 125. This case states that the calvaria, along with internal organs, have been damaged. The calvaria, you want to know? It's known as the skull cap to some people. It includes the superior parts of the frontal, occipital, and parietal portion of the head. Hence, skull cap. That's the calvaria for ya. It's kind of like where you put your cap. The calvaria is where you put your cap. The skull cap. What? The cap of the skull? Yes, the calvaria. Uh -huh. Do you remember it now, bitch? Uh, I do. Yeah, me too. Nobody asked you. Go back to Grouch Gabbler, or whatever you do call him. I call him Captain Anus Sniffer behind his... Oh, wait, this is recorded. He's supposed to be listening to us to make sure I do my... Oh, fuck. Said too much. Well, since Void's not here, I better start doing the editing. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> the acceptable bone, if you don't know is the most inferior portion of your skull. And it's also the most posterior. Then the parietal is like on the top, you know. It's in the frontal portion. I, I think that doesn't need to be explained, right? Yeah. One of the sources I read said that the case seven, eight, and nine are some of the most interesting. But you know, I think that's all subjective. Depends on what you think is interesting, right? But swagglers. Now, I know Source 2 shows the hieroglyphs in the breakdown of several items, including the brain and preparation, along with description of the brain, sim which is said to be similar to molten copper. They didn't use the word similar. They said like, like, um, totally. Literally like molten copper. The copper is molten and it looks just like a brain. That's exactly what, yeah, exactly what it says. Satire. In the parentheses. But, located near the top of source number 5, is a specific hieroglyph that you can easily view, which is for the word brain in hieroglyphs. Specifically the ones that are used for the Edwin Smith papyrus. Yep, if you look at it, it appears to me 
as if a bird is facing to the left, like the profile of a bird. And then right next to it is a feather about the size of the bird. Or a chef knife or some type of embalming tool, you know. We have this correlation sensation with Egyptian culture and mummies a lot of the time. So, embalming tool will definitely come to mind sometimes, you know. Yes, the blade of the knife or the embalming tool or the feather is facing the bird, which I stated. Which is looking to the left, like I already stated. And then there's also like a line that kind of makes me like a, like a U-turn. But it, it's a little bit longer on the left hand side. Almost kind of like a cane shape. And then right next to it is like like this thing that looks like a computer mouse. But they didn't have computers back then. So I'd assume it may be like the beginning of a head without the face. But it had two ears on each side. It was kind of tilted like say what? And then it had like, like a little hair sticking out the top of it. Kind of look cool, you know. But I don't know how that looked like brain. Unless they're calling someone a bird brain. Even then, it's like bird, knife, chain, head. Maybe, maybe the bird stood for knowledge. Maybe, you know, maybe the knife said, if you cut open for knowledge, you'll make a U-turn and you see something inside the head. Bah, I give up. No wonder why they required multiple sapiens of Homo to look at this up. Using this biological avatar, it's kind of hard to use all the different information that's coming at me at once. Yeah. So. I'll break down a little bit of uh, Case 3's hieroglyphics. It just humors me, you know. I like to pretend like I can figure things out without actually knowing things, you know kind of boosts up my my uh, ego especially when I already know what it says but then I try to pretend like I figured it out on my own make me feel like top doggy so it looks like this vertical line half a tr half a rectangle opening to the right for a knife and a piece of something just to the right of the upper portion of said knife being uneducated, I'd assume it meant the border is cutting a specific area on an upper location. Hence the upper part, you know, right above the knife of some object being cut by the knife, you know, in the border. Then we have some eye shape without a pupil or an iris, followed by a cup or a bowl with an unknown object to myself, tool, hovering over said cup slash ball, with a kneeling man and an object penetrated by a horizontal line above the kneeling man's head. So even though I have no education, I like to pretend I can decipher the communication, you know, on the, you know, it'd be kind of funny if there wasn't really anything being communicated, they were just, you know, really high on opium and stuff and they were just you know the pharaoh's like draw me a bird now draw me this shape you know that'd be pretty funny but anyways if i were to assume the communication of this it would be something like this uh one you know something cooked up by some tool like this object over the cup slash ball it also left a man kneeling because it had penetrated the upper portion of the individual who's kneeling hence the vertical i mean the horizontal line with the object being penetrated penetrated now after these hieroglyphs there's a vertical line and then a little bit more space between the vertical line and the rest of the hieroglyphs and i would say it would be like end of a phrase kind of like a sentence, you know, put in hieroglyphs. But then again, what do I know? I didn't bother trying to translate all the hieroglyphs because I figured it wouldn't be too interesting. So I went into action just to read the translation of case number three, huh? I will quote it now. If thou examinest a man having a gaping wound in his head, penetrating to the bone and perforating his skull, Thou shalt palpate his wound, 
doubts should find him unable to look at his two shoulders and his breast in suffering from stiffness in the neck parentheses conclusion and diagnosis end of parentheses this truly isn't far off from what I said like I said now perhaps I have read it before I tried to translate the hieroglyphs or perhaps I did the other way vice versa if you want to say it that way either way you will never know no matter what I say I cannot convince those who don't believe me and vice versa but I will tell you this you better believe me motherfucker anywho I can see that there are some sort of injury penetrating because of that object you know so What's, what's so hard to believe that someone could, you know, have an idea of what's being said? You know, kind of like if you know English or Spanish, you could kind of get an understanding of Italian or French or something like that. Not German. Goddamn phone. Goddamn phone. If that offends you, goddamn it. Stop getting so offended. Huh? What's that for? You need to be nicer to your list. Fuck you. Anyways, back to topic. Hmm. Now we're gonna go down. Past, past the owls and other hieroglyphs to that other section, that diagnosis. Huh? Thou should say regarding... Oh, wait. Yeah, diagnosis. The Once again, I shall quote it. Thou should say, parenthesis, regarding... In parentheses, him. And then it's quoting inside the quotations. Whew. One having, parentheses, a gaby wound in his head, penetrating to the bone, and perforating a skull, while he suffers from stiffness in the neck, an ailment, an ailment which I will treat. I don't know precisely why one would require a parentheses other than to just take out any ambiguity. Ambiguity, yeah. That's the word. Ambiguity. That is the only reason why I would think they would put the parentheses there. But if I was reading that, they'd be like, yeah, you just said that. You just said man come in with all these things. I know the man came in with it. It's the same section, same case. Of course, it's going to have the same issues. This is diagnosis time, not recap of, you know, the symptoms time. Pfft. Let's go to the treatment, huh? For case number three. Now... After thou hast stitched it, thou should lay fresh meat upon his wound the first day. Thou shalt not bind more him at his mooring stakes until the period of injury passes by. Although should treat it afterwards with grease, honey, and mint every day until it recovers. Now, I know some people may say this sounds like witchcraft or what they call cookery or crocker sheet but there are studies showing how honey has enzymite enzymatic functions for antimicrobial properties which would explain why they'd lather you with honey if you were hurt now void may say something like Oh, it's sweet. It may make you feel better because it's sweet or it may smell good. But I don't buy that for one second. And then we have, you know, lint. Lint is good for absorbing things. And so is fresh meat. Don't ask me how I know. Okay, I tell you. Google. They also use grease. Grease is good at covering things. You know, to make sure no debris get inside of it. You don't want any foreign debris in there, do you? You may have some type of fungus or bacteria go from the debris into your wound. And then you may have some mushroom growing out of your wound. No, you don't have no mushroom, but you will have some sort of sepsis, perhaps, if you have the wrong type of bacteria or a fungus in there. Ooh. And don't ask me how I know, but it hurts. Okay, I tell you, one time I got hurt and I didn't put grease on it, bam. That's not really how it happened. But I got infected because I did not wash or because I have a weak immune system. Compromised, perhaps. 
Maybe because I've been eating a lot of honey. Too much sugar. Not good for the immune system. Yeah, anyways, you don't want any foreign objects foreign. Something similar here. It's a common theme. Foreign objects? You don't want foreign objects in you. Humans don't like foreign objects. Go build, build a wall. Put grease on your wound. He said, put a wall. But you're only covering one portion of the border. And then you're not thinking about underneath it. You still have a wall. You can go underneath it. Or you can fly. Or ride a boat. Or go from the other border. After arriving at the other country, country just north of your country. With a boat or airplane. And just walk across Canadian border. Or you can come in from a spacecraft and land. Unnoticed. Dropping off a couple of different human I mean aliens. I mean humans. Off. Yeah. And then, then you have Captain Grouch Gobbler wanting to build a wall around the Mars like it was a great idea. Be trying to keep the humans out of Mars even though they've already been there and contaminated our sterile surface. Humans didn't even bother to think why might the surface be sterile. And then they get amazed that they find the bacteria growing on Mars when really it was just bacteria from contamination when they brought their crap over there. Fuck. Oh. Fuck, I forgot I was recording. God damn it. Shit, what was I doing? Huh? Here, we talk about Greece. It was all Greece's fault. Not the country, but the stuff that people put on wounds back in ancient Egypt time. Back to topic. The title given to this case is, wait, what we do here? Let's go to case number four, huh? It is titled, A Gaping Wound in the Head, Penetrating to the Bone, and Splitting the Skull. Whoa. There's the jelly. Cases which precede this one are said to be not nearly as serious as it. Hmm. Not even penetrating the skull is as dangerous as penetrating and splitting the skull. Where is the examination portion quoted? If thou examinest a man having a gaping wound in his head, penetrating to the bone and splitting his skull, thou shalt palpate his wound. Shouldst thou find something disturbing therein under his fingers, and he shudders exceedingly, while the swelling which is over it protrudes, which discharges blood from both his nostrils and from both his ears, he suffers with stiffness in the neck, and that he is unable to look at the shoulders and his breast. Conclusion in diagnosis. Wow. Let's go to diagnosis, shall we? Thou should say regarding him. One having a gaping wound in his head penetrating to the bone and splitting a skull while he discharges blood from both his nostrils in both his ears, he suffers from stiffness in the neck, an ailment with which I will contend. At this point, as a patient, I'd say, no shit. You say all this no shit stuff to me. Of course, you will contend to it. That's why I come to you, you bastard. Hmm. Contend. Contested number one. Dr. Hogabood. He will treat me for my boo-boo. Yeah. You want to go to treatment, people? I do, so. Too bad if you don't. Now when thou findst that the skull of a man is split, thou shouldst not bind him, but moor him at his mooring stakes until the period of his injury passes by. His treatment is sitting. Make him two supports of brick until thou knowest he hath reached the decisive point. Thou should apply grease to his head from your nutsack. No, I added that in there. Soften his neck there within and both shoulders. Wow, makes no sense to me. 
Oi, I'm not even finished with the quote. Thou shouldst do likewise for every man whom f thou findest having a split skull. Could you imagine nowadays go to a doctor with a split skull, bleeding and all this crazy shit? Terrible migraine headache, pulsating ears, gushing blood with nose bl gushing blood. And then you go to the doctor and he goes, Okay, I have two bricks for you. You sit down over there. Let me unzip my pants, put my nuts on your face, and I'll wrap grease around it, baby. No. That don't happen today. No. They give you pill. They say, take this bitch, because what I'm about to do is gonna hurt. And even when I stick this needle all over you to numb you up, you're still gonna be in excruciating pain. Because right now, your head is cracked. You are currently fucked until I drill holes and put plates on you and make you special. I really don't know much about what they do, but I do know this much. Ow. It is said, though, that case number five is more serious than four. Huh? Oh, I messed up big time, people. Forgive me. It says, any case before case four, which were only three. We're not as serious as number four, but it says here case number five is much more serious. Let's let's give a quote for the examination, shall we? If thou examinest a man having a gaping wound to his head, penetrating to the bone, and smashing, smashing, how, smashing score? To what he have do? Elephant sit on head? Oh, thou shouldst thou pay his wound. Huh. I hope he do more than that, than put grease on him and set the two bricks there to hold him in place. Shouldst thou find that smash which is in his skull deep and sunken under thy finger, while the swelling which is over it protrudes, he discharges blood from both nostrils and his ears, and suffers from stiffness in his neck, so that he is unable to look at his shoulders or his breast. Conclusion and Diagnosis Sounds exactly like case number four. I think they got a little lazy. Perhaps not. Perhaps the symptoms are very similar. The only difference is your skull is crushed and not just a split. Oh, what? I was complaining about my boobies hurting, but now, now my head hurt more. Oh, yeah, tell me that. Ain't that right, Void? Yes, that is very right. Damn right. The quote for the diagnosis of case 5 is as follows. Thou should say regarding him, one having a gaping wound in his head penetrating to the bone and smashing his skull while he suffers from stiffness in his neck. An ailment not to be, not, not to be treated, huh? He, he has lots of confidence in his uh, capabilities here. He might as well have just said, give as much opium as patient desires. Jeez, cause you screwed. Even though it says not to treat the poor bastards in the prior thing here, it still has a treatment section for this case. It is as foul as it is as foul fouls follows. Ooh. Tell you that stroke really got me. What? Thou should not bind him but moor him at his mooring stakes, just like case four, until the period of his injury passes. It's like they just put him away to fight it off by his own. Best of luck. You want to go to case six? This is the big one. A lot of people say this is where they have the first publicly known description in any type of medical documents in the history of mankind for describing the brain, and also the meninges. Before I get into meninges, let's go into this, huh? Thou shalt... Wait. If thou examine a man having a gaping wound in his head, penetrating to the bone, smashing his skull, and rending open the brain of his skull, thou should palpate his wound. Shouldst thou find that smash which is in his skull, like those corrugations which form from molten copper. Like I said to people, 
Something therein throbbing and fluttering under thy fingers, like the weak place of an infant's crown before it becomes whole. When it has happened, there is no throbbing and fluttering under thy fingers until the brain of his, the patient's, skull is rent open. He discharges blood from both his nostrils and his ears and suffers from stiffness in his neck. Conclusion and diagnosis. Ah. Now, even though the translation doesn't indicate meninges, but more just, well, it does kind of indicate it, you know, but also, it's not very clear about the meninges, but the molten copper is definitely a description of the brain. Unless they just completely made it up and they misinterpreted hieroglyphs altogether, which wouldn't, wouldn't put that past the human species, you know. Let's go into meninges, huh? We know what the brain is, right? Right? Yeah, you do. You are, you better know. God damn. The meninges are described as a cushioning around your brain and spinal cord. It contains spine, cerebrospinal fluid, which now, more modern time, they have concluded that it has lymph function. At first, a lot of doctors speculated that it couldn't possibly be lymph function because of the the blood-brain barrier, but you need to get those neurotransmitters out every once in a while. And actually, recent studies have shown that when you sleep, your brain flushes its cerebrospinal fluid to give you new cerebrospinal fluid to clear out the neurotransmitters, kind of like a reset. But while it does that, the neurotransmitters still stimulate your brain, and it kind of does like a replay of your previous day when you get enough sleep. That's why sleep is so important. It helps solidify memories, you know. It also helps keep you awake when you need to be awake. And it helps for your focus, too. If you haven't noticed, when you don't get your full sleep, you feel like a damn turd. Or like you got stroke. Strokey, stroke, stroke, stroke. Anyways, there are three known layers of the meninges. We have the dura matter, which is the uppermost. Dura for durable. It is the most durable. Then you have the rachnoid matter. Don't ask me why they call it the rachnoid matter. It doesn't matter. I have already recorded this, and I'm just in some type of devices recording, not actually talking to you to listen. And then we have the pia matter. Yes, the pia matter. It's the most, most deep matter, which is the layer. And in between the pia matter and the arachnoid matter is what we call cerebrospinal fluid. The pia matter, by the way, is more sensitive. Now, this information was not known at this time, unless if it was, and there's a whole bunch of documents that happened to be destroyed, which would not surprise me. It wouldn't surprise me if they knew a whole bunch about anatomy that got destroyed or hasn't been found yet. Either way, that is not the topic of today. It is the Edwin Smith Papyrus. Now, Edwin, Edwin Smith Papyrus case number six is considered the most important one to some doctors, especially regarding neuroscience. They get amazed. Well, they, they figure out what the brain looks like, and they described it. Really? You didn't see the Sphinx or the pyramid or the other pyramid or the other pyramid? Didn't see that? How about the crazy amount of effort it took to bake that thing? Jesus Christ, you think seeing some dude who got hurt in the wound or got hurt in battle with a smashed skull and describing what you see in your known language is so difficult, especially when you do it in some sort of organized fashion, you think that's amazing? Jeez, so demeaning. You really think about it, how pompous you have to be to believe that you are much more intelligent than those who lived 20,000 years before you. 20,000 years. You know what's happened between now and 20,000 years ago, people? The average size of the skull shrunk. A lot of scientists have postulated that it is because we don't need that much space for the brain now because it's shrunk. And some may go as far as to say that um, society has allowed less intelligent people to survive and thrive and procreate with less intelligent people. 
I, for one, I think is different. I think it's different because your brain doesn't need so much growth because you don't need, there's more specialty, you know. You don't need to go hunting and you don't need to go remember all the smells for survival while hunting. You don't need to do so much work. And you don't need to figure out how to entertain people so much. You just click on the TV and watch the boob tube. Right? Ain't that true? Yeah. You do your job. You do your job the way you do it. Whether it be as hard working or a lazy son of a bitch. Fuck you if you're lazy. Fuck you on the ass. I hate it when you're lazy. Go bust your ass. You don't like your job? Bust your ass more. And focus on something you want to do. Like me. Look, I don't. I like this, I go do research. That's what I do. That's what I like to do. But I try to work hard. You want to know why? You're not worth your own salt if you don't try your best. That's what my dad told me. I always beat myself up, though. Do what you do. I don't give a fuck. What am I thinking? We're talking about brain size here. 20,000 years ago, sapiens of the homo had a bigger brain size. Imagine that. And then you have people now, they go, wow, they actually know what the brain look like? Oh, you're talking about the same people who have no problem crucifying, mutilating individuals that just looked at their wife, stoning people, killing people because they fucked each other in the butthole. What? That is that the big of a deal for you? You are amazed that they, they took note of what happened when they split someone's asshole open? Pah! I think I'm done ranting here. Back to topic, right? The diagnosis for case 6 is short and to the point. Sweet, unlike that rant. It consists of 9 words. Most of which aren't considered to be words of much significance. You want to know why I said that? Thou should say, an ailment not to be treated. Hmm. Hmm, sounds like he fucked. Now, at this point, I don't know how much the patient would be able to understand the doctor, but you know, shit happens. Fortunately, there's also a treatment portion here. Even though the physician was directed by this manual not to to treat. And here it is. Thou should anoint what? No. Thou should anoint that wound with grease. Thou shalt not bind it. Thou shalt not apply two strips upon it until notice that he has reached a decisive point. So there is some bleak amount of hope left. I would have assumed wrong. And of course I did. Because I said not to treat him. Except to put grease on his head to protect it from foreign matter. Puh. Foreign matter, I show you. Foreign matter. I do understand why they have a treatment section, even though it says not to treat, because you got to give the doctor something to go off of, even though it says not to treat. Even though the treatment is kind of like, hey, put the grease on his head and tell him, tough it out. Even if you weren't supposed to do anything, I would imagine they'd have a section there anyways. Just because it's standard operating procedures. You want to take out all ambiguity. Actually, starting to think about it. Not allowing people to uh, use their own minds to assume what to do. And to make mistakes because life is filled with learning experiences and mistakes. Perhaps that's why humans' brains have gotten smaller in the last 20,000 years. What do you think, Void? That sounds the most logical explanation I could think of, besides the one you said before in your end, which made way more sense. But then again, I'm not really here at all. That's right. Back to topic. Case 7. This case is said to describe uncontrollable shaking leading to many thinking that it describes seizures. And the examination will be uh, described right now. 
If thou examinest a man having a gaping wound to his head, penetrating to the bone, and perforating the structures of his skull, thou should palpate his wound, although he shudders exceedingly. Thou should cause him to lift his face, if it is painful for him to open his mouth, and his heart beats feebly. If thou observe his spittle hanging between his two lips, and not falling off, while he discharges blood from both his nostrils and his ears, and suffers from stiffness in his neck, and is unable to look at his shoulders and his breast. Conclusion and diagnosis. It's pretty sweet, if you ask me. This case is the best by far. Not because it shows that someone was able to describe the brain, which is not too hard, but because it describes a sapien of Homo, who is drooling uncontrollably and having seizures. Must be quite a sight. We well, think if one had the post-traumatic stress syndrome, it wouldn't also, or well, it wouldn't be limited to the warriors, but also the people who had to deal with this stuff. You imagine, some dude you knew from yesterday come to you on a gurney, or come to you on some cot being carried by two other men, and he, he up there with his hands up close to his chest, with his fingers kind of all oh, mutilated looking like he can't control anything, having spasms, his eyes are in two different locations, his uh, his mouth is kind of open a little bit with his tongue kind of sticking out and drooling and he... <laughs> Now that, that would be traumatic to me too. Now for the diagnosis section. There are two given diagnoses. Let's begin with the first, because that's logical, right? Number one, thou should say regarding him, one having a gaping wound to his uh, head, penetrating to the bone and perforating the structures of his skull, the cord of his mandible is contracted. He discharges blood from both his nostrils and from both his ears. He also suffers from stiffness in his neck, an ailment which I will contend. Oh, okay. Let's go for number two. One having a gaping wound in his head, penetrating to the bone, perforating the structures of his skull. He has developed this. Oh, he has developed it to his mouth. Yep. I don't know what I wrote, actually. I kind of fumbled on this one. He has developed something. T-Y. Don't know what that could possibly be. Very professional, right? Yeah. You did your best, Clark. That's all you can do. I didn't do my best. This was all a rush moment. Like Rush Limbaugh. You know who he is? If you don't, you can look him up too. Look, I just told you a no shit statement. I must be getting tired from my stroke. Yeah, it says here his mouth is bound and he suffers from stiffness in his neck. An ailment not to be treated. So, it looks like this, hmm, I don't know what the difference between this one. Not much of a difference. It has to do with his mandible, though. <clears throat> Let's do the treatment section, shall we? Maybe we'll get past this and you'll forget about it, huh? Now, as soon as thou findest the man that his cord of his mandible, of his jaw is contracted, thou should have made for him something hot until he is comfort, comfortable, so that his mouth opens. Oh, you know, seems like case number one is worse because his mandible is fucked up to the point where you need to make something, you know, you need to actually treat him. Thou should bind it with grease, honey, and lint until thou knowest that he has reached a decisive point. And then for the second treatment, we have this quote. Where did it go? The quote moved on me. No. I have something on my glasses. Crusty crust. Oh. If, however, thou find it. What the hell? No. For the second outcome treatment, we have this quote. Oh. For this one, there is no. Oh, no treatment. Oh, yeah. Ha. Wow. So they didn't follow standard operating procedures on this one. You know, unlike the previous one where that actually has a treatment section where it says not to treat them, 
you know, except for it says, hey, put the grease on his head and let him, you know, do his thing. This one here actually has none. So there's no follow-up. That's weird. That don't make sense. The, the continuity error. Kind of like watching a movie where this guy has a green tie that is uh, tightened up all the way. And then the next scene, his, uh, his tie is a slightly different color green and a little bit loose. You know, like, wow, that's, that's an error of continuity. Now, of course, neuroscience goes into the brain injuries, but there's also a spinal cord. So, we're going to go into some spinal injuries, huh? Case 31 is described as follows. It is a cervical injury, with which doesn't include penetration, but rather dislocation. The significant symptoms given are that the motor and sensory loss and uh, the extremities below the dislocation of the vertebrae is uh, no longer there. So it's paralysis. There's also priapism, which is painful, uncontrollable erection of the penis. I told you so. Urinary incontinence or oh. abdominal dissension. Didn't say that earlier, but there's that one. Oh. And spermatoria, with bloodshot eyes. Hmm, I wonder why they coupled the two together. Yeah, yeah, you know, the guy with spermatoria and bloodshot eyes. Like, why not bloodshot eyes? Why not go from superior to inferior? You know, follow the same, you know, follow the same pathway like you do from case 1 to 48. But here we go, spermatoria and bloodshot eyes. Great googly moogly. I would assume this is not to be treated. Even though, from the documentation, that doesn't mean the doctor didn't put the person somewhere, you know, till the patient came to some sort of success. Although he is paralyzed, can't really do anything. Hmm, case 33. It's a burst fracture of the cervical vertebrae, like I said in the beginning of the juicy bits. Or once juicy bits, but now old, crusty, and dusty. And uh, this results to similar symptoms to that of case 31. So, whether it's a burst or dislocation, you're going to have things like incontinence, priapism, abdominal distension, and spermatoria. Spermatoria. What a name. Why is it that I feel so dirty? There's also what is stated as a stupor and aphasia for two additional symptoms, making this sound like uh, more serious. Not that the burst fracture doesn't sound more serious than dislocation, but damn. I would imagine that uh, all the nerve connection was uh, abolished on case 33, because when you have a burst fracture, you're going to have bones going places and cutting things up dislocation you may have mangled some of the nerves but you know I'd imagine some of the nerves still be connected you know maybe not too well depends on the situation huh but I would say that uh, this is pretty good information given that we can describe the brain and it shows that there's some sort of understanding that there's meninges also known as a sack wait Sack. Whoa. Meninges equals sack. <gasps> I got meninges between my legs. And on my brain. Oh, I got to tell Void when he comes back. Oh, I can't wait. I'm going to tell him about the meninges. I'm going to tell him my meninges scratch. Scratch my itchy meninges. Ah, oh, yeah, the greasy meninges. Oh, this is good. Yeah, so they showed the description of the brain meninges and how spinal injury uh, ends up in paralysis and different tissues that would fucking shock the shit out of most of you, especially those who get easily upset when someone says fuck, shit, piss, goddammit, cunt, asshole, whore. You get upset about that. Real life will really scare the shit out of you, especially when you see someone have their neck explode. Jesus Christ. Superstar. Who or what in the world do you think? You, what the fuck happened to my brain? Something crazy. Anyways, 
if these words, these sounds I make with my mouth, upset you, please, for the benefit of you, me, of course, and everybody else around you, pull your head out your ass. These words are just descriptions of the world around you. And what you're really upset with is the correlation sensation of what you haven't experienced much with. Whether that be bloody anus, bloody nostrils, spermatoria, priapism, or just damn someone else who disagrees with you. Realize, people change their mind from time to time. They're not going to change their mind and listen to you if you're a douchebag about it. No. So, this is the end of episode 4, Edwin Smith for Paris. Hope you enjoyed this one. I can't wait for Void to come back. Because I have a feeling things got a little bit more fun when he was here. I know it was for me. He should be coming back though. It is a new year. And it uh, will have new beginnings. Great beginnings, I hope. Anyways, we will leave you in peace. Or I will leave you, rather. With his scapegoat song, listen. Go check us out on the webs. Oh, Corinne, so come on.